secret preparation put into explosive action. Simply an amazing sight. We did, after all, see a million men come out of the water there, and it was quite an extraordinary sight. The superiority of the Allies was so overwhelming that if you were to quantify their air superiority, then you'd have to say that it was 20 to 1. November 8, 1942, Operation Torch. Target, North Africa. All very, very secret, you know, we were going overseas. Despite careful security measures, American and British pilots sense that something big is in the wind. David Cox, RAF. I remember they were saying, right, the rumor is West Africa, we're going to invade Casablanca and round there. A massive American force, supported by British naval and air power, storms ashore at Casablanca, Oran, and Algiers. The Allies gain a quick beachhead, but they face immediate challenge from the veteran Luftwaffe and a hardened Africa Corps, commanded by General Erwin Rommel, the Desert Fox. The action is non-stop and lethal. Jerry Collingsworth, United States Army Air Force, finds himself in a Western-style shootout over the desert. His motive is revenge. I was not shooting with the express purpose of killing anyone. I was shooting for the express purpose of shooting that airplane down. If he got killed in the process, that's what the game was about. Except this one time, and this day I was after the man. Because by sheer luck, this Falk Wolf 190 failed to get me, and he got my wingman, who was a close friend. We were flying low level in bad weather in Tunisia. And I remember thinking, friends, you know, the bop out turned the Spitfire, but I knew you couldn't. So I rock over to keep him in sight. I rock this way, because we were in this kind of a turn. I rock this way, and I see him explode. Uh, you might say the adrenaline was flowing pretty good. Jack Ilfrey, one of America's first World War II aces, scores a kill over the desert. The three men in the ME-110 that I shot down jumped out and started running. And I thought to myself, to God knows where out here. It was just real deserty, you know. So just as a lark and uh, frivolous or devilish, whatever, I circled around and I set that in one ten on fire. And then I headed toward that crew. They were running one behind the other. And I gave them a few short bursts just off to the side. I wasn't about to shoot them. They fell down and they raised their fists at me and I just got the biggest kick out of that in the world. <laughs> Made me laugh. Yeah. For fighter pilots, the desert war is relentless. Smoldering sand and scorpions on the ground, death in the air. One of the things that we found uh, a great strain was not only the living conditions, we all lived in one tent, 20 of us with our sort of feet to the middle, but the uh, Luftwaffe used to send a couple of 88s and they used to put, go round and round the airfield and drop one bomb about every quarter of an hour. Only a small one, but still it was a bomb. And obviously it didn't get any sleep. And made us all very irritable and obviously, uh, did a, you know, for morale, didn't do much good. General Rommel's Africa Corps is squeezed by the British from the east and the Americans from the west. The Desert Fox begs Berlin for supplies and reinforcements. 
But his army is strangled by an uncanny Allied talent for finding top secret German convoys. Harry Broadhurst, RAF. Oh, they were in a mess. Uh, they were, we were doing to them in the desert what they'd done to us in France. We had Ultra, which we helped us to sink their ships with petrol and oil and ammunition. So they were being pretty hard pressed. Ultra, the war's best kept secret. The British have broken the German code. Harry Broadhurst is one of the few with access to Ultra alerts. He reads Rommel's dispatches and knows the route of German air transports. Just before the end of the war in Africa, they were flying the stuff in and signaling the time of takeoff and the, where they were taking off from to their headquarters in North Africa. This started to come in to me, and uh, it didn't take me long to work that one out. And we absolutely slaughtered them. March 1943. Short on supplies and ammunition, the once elite Africa Corps crumbles under Allied attack. Hugh Cocky Dundas, British Desert Air Force. Uh, I was cruising around in my Jeep, just looking about, and I came across a came into sort of great amphitheater in, in the ground somewhere outside Tunis. And there must have been 15 or 20,000 German soldiers there who were assembled, being organized into prisoner of war things. And, and I'd always remember just sitting there in my Jeep and looking down and seeing these people and thinking, well, my God, that's something which I didn't know that I'd ever see. Very uh, different looking lot from what one envisaged German soldiers as being when they were taking part in the Blitzkrieg in spring 1940, you know. By May, the Luftwaffe is withdrawn. Rommel leaves Africa and returns home to face Hitler's rage. The Africa Corps surrenders. With North Africa won, the Allies look north toward Sicily, stepping stone to Fortress Europe. Guts, General George Patton, and the British 8th under Field Marshal Bernard Monty Montgomery overrun Sicily. We were on the doorstep of Europe again, and the next moment we were in. That, that was, uh, there was real elation about that. One felt good about that. A month later, General Dwight D. Eisenhower launches the first Allied invasion of mainland Europe at Salerno, Italy. September 1943, the Allies are back on European soil. Jerry Collinsworth scores a kill and watches the frantic pilot try to escape a flaming plane. And jettisons his canopy. Now, Falkworth canopy just slides directly back and it missed me by about 30 feet. So when he did that, I figured he was going to bail out and I stopped shooting. And he did, he bailed out and as I went by him, I was really surprised to see this chute harness come loose from him. And so the chute went one way, his airplane went one way, and he went another way. Well, that's what the business was about. From the air, the shattered town of Casino is little more than a name on a map after six months of savage battle for this key bastion on the road to Rome. Patrick Jill describes it as the 
the soft underbelly of Europe. In fact, the battle for the Italian boot will prove one of the war's bloodiest. Allied fighters fly treacherous ground support missions against deadly German ak ak fire. Ground attack um, work it, it, it became something of a, of a fascination, as a matter of fact. Uh, the army was, had a very, very tough job in Italy because the terrain, as you know, is, is far from easy. Um, and, and, and the Germans were fighting every inch of the way. Mike Russo, United States Army Air Force, is one of two survivors of a group of 47 pilots who trained together. One time I was on an observation mission, and I saw a troop of uh, Germans marching down the street in north of Rome. And I'm sure they saw me, and I saw them, but I didn't do anything about it, and they kept on marching. And then I turned over on my back like I was going to dive bomb, and I dive bombed toward the road in the directions they were coming. I just flew down the top of the street so they didn't see me coming. As soon as I saw them, I strafed uh, the road and killed uh, some 300 men. I got back and they gave me the title of the killer. American heavy bombers fly from North Africa and over Italy to attack the oil fields in Ploesti, Romania, a crucial source of Luftwaffe fuel. Eric Hartman will become the war's top fighter ace with an incredible 352 confirmed kills. In Romania, we defended an oil area. The Americans would come every day exactly at 11 o'clock like a train. They had 1,000 bombers and 500 fighters. We fought against them. There were four of us. We were completely overwhelmed. They flew out of North Africa. They flew over Naples, Rome, Milan. When you wanted to attack the flying fortress, the best tactic was to attack them from behind at a higher speed, rather than be exposed to the firepower of 30 to 40 machine guns. Because they flew in formation, it was like flying through a snowstorm of projectiles and you would close your eyes. Our younger pilots could survive on the average of only two such attacks, and then they were dead. The bombs from these giants are a drumbeat, signaling the death of the Third Reich. Rome is liberated. The countdown to D-Day, the invasion of France, has already begun. June the 6th, 1944, Operation Overlord, D-Day. The assault on Hitler's fortress Europe begins. An Allied force of 3 million men, 12,000 planes, and more than 6,000 ships will test Hitler's vaunted wall of steel and fire. People of Western Europe, a landing was made this morning on the coast of France by troops of the Allied Expeditionary Force. This landing is part of the concerted United Nations plan for the liberation of Europe. Pilots flying over the vast invasion force see a sight they will never forget, an astonishing armada stretching from horizon to horizon. Jeffrey Page, Royal Air Force. On the morning of D-Day, the first light, what was called HR, I was leading my squadron of Spitfires, and our particular mission was to fly a beach cover over the American beaches of Omaha and Utah. I must say that to 
to have been there at HR um, on D-Day was the most fantastic experience, seeing all these ships and these troops going ashore on the beaches. It had a particular significance for me because I had flown at the time of Dunkirk and watched the remnants of the British Army being taken off by rescue ships. Uh, so to see them going back and our American allies and Canadians, everybody else, it, it was a great thrill. It was the most spectacular thing I have ever seen. The thousands and thousands of uh, boats converging in prongs, uh, and we were sitting there as top cover for the bombers that had been in a few minutes earlier to do everything they could before the ground troops landed. Air trigger tension is the mood over the Normandy beachhead. Andrew McKenzie, RAF. The whole Navy, who was protecting the beaches, started shooting at us. And at the time, Lloyd, Lloyd Chadburn was leading our squadron, one of our famous Canadian wing commanders. And he called to them over the radio and said, you know, Christ, chaps, it's the Spitfires from England uh, to cover the beaches. Stop firing. And they didn't stop. I guess they were so uh, maybe a little bit trigger happy that uh, they were shooting at their own airplanes. But that happens in a war, you know, and people make mistakes. James Goodson, one of seven Americans who fought in the Battle of Britain, flies with the U.S. 4th Fighter Group. We had to eliminate the Luftwaffe when the troops were coming in, which we did. Only two Luftwaffe planes got through to the beachhead. Walter Kropinski, Luftwaffe, sees his squadron decimated. My strongest memory is when your D-Day started in France. We moved from Germany to France, and we had just filled up the whole group with aircraft and pilots. So I flew out with 68 aircraft and came back one month later exactly with no aircraft and two pilots. One of them was myself. When you're the fighter pilot and you see a target, be it an enemy fighter or an enemy bomber, uh, only one thought gets through your mind and that is to attack him. Never, never, never do you think of you know, go home and fly another day. So, um, hunting is, is, is a great game. The beachhead secured, Allied fighters probe the sky over France, seeking the enemy. Peter Brothers, RAF. The opposition suddenly was awfully disappointing. One felt rather sorry. Um, well, I got tangled up with some 190s, and the chap I shot down obviously didn't know the first thing about it. He was just gently turning from left to right as though he was peering over his left shirt and right shirt, wondering what to do. It was rather sad. I wondered whether he was on his first sortie. <laughs> well, we'd allowed for the Luftwaffe being there. Uh, but they weren't. And they were stretched to hell. And we had a superiority. But nevertheless, we expected they would oppose the invasion, particularly on the beaches. But they didn't. Adolf Galland, general of the Luftwaffe fighter pilots, witnesses the methodical destruction of the fighter forces he helped create. Where was the Luftwaffe? It cannot be excused by stating that the pilots were cowards, that they were afraid. This was claimed later on by Goering and the leadership, and Hitler as well. The Luftwaffe overstretched itself. The Luftwaffe overextended, overtaxed itself. For this reason, the Luftwaffe could no longer be present in many areas. As soon as a German plane appeared in an airfield, immediately there was an Allied fighter group on top of it. All our airports were bombed, all fuel tanks destroyed. Our defense industry capability was destroyed. 
by the time of the invasion, we were completely bled white. We were simply swept from the skies. Fortress Europe was effectively without a roof over its head. August 25th, 1944. Allied forces reached the outskirts of Paris. City of Light is left to the free French troops. General Charles de Gaulle leads a victory parade along the Champs Elysees. Elation of victory soon gives way to grim reality. Their homeland now in peril, the Germans fight with renewed determination. armies aim their thrust at the Rhine, gateway to the heart of the Reich. 